About two months ago, we uh, held a panel on the current economic downturn and appropriate uh, government policy making in light of the downturn, and also words of advice for individual investors, business decision makers in light of the downturn. And we received favorable, very favorable response from both the audience that was with us in person as well as uh, people that had the opportunity to view it in webcast form uh, later on. Uh, a number of people asked for a reprise of the evening. Uh, that's why we're here tonight and we hope uh, on this topic, but certainly a lot of uh, heat has been shed on, uh, we can also help shed some light for you. Uh, first, would like to welcome to the podium Susan Halliday, the president and publisher of the RBJ, our co-sponsor for this evening's activity as well as the panel we did two months ago. Susan. Thank you very much. It's indeed my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. We are so very pleased to again partner with the Simon Graduate School of Business in these wonderful surroundings, Jiva Theater, to bring you another in this series of economic forums. RBJ, as you know, is committed to providing you with the information and analysis that you need to navigate in these challenging times. And events such as these are an important component of the arsenal of information that you have. We hope you find this evening's panel informative. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We have uh, five panelists tonight, and we've asked them in a particular order to uh, frame the dialogue, and then we'll open it up for questions. We've already received some questions, but we'll circulate cards and then coalesce uh, where the most uh, saliences among the questions and what would help best to move the dialogue forward. Uh, the first person, uh, we're very privileged to have one of the top uh, bankruptcy law experts in the country with us at the University of Rochester. He holds an appointment both at the Simon School as well as at the college at the university. He formerly served for over a decade. We were privileged to have him as the ninth president of our university. Before that, uh, he served as the provost and the law dean at Virginia. And before that also uh, served in government on the Stanford faculty, a graduate of Williams and Yale Law School, a clerk for um, a justice of the Supreme Court, Rehnquist, uh, Tom Jackson. Well, welcome. I, I think the set backdrop is perhaps appropriate for the topic uh, tonight. Um, I want to place in context the issue of bankruptcy uh, versus bailouts in particular because I suspect we haven't seen the last of business or industries facing such choices. Uh, my special knowledge is bankruptcy much more so than political bailouts, so I'd like to talk about what bankruptcy can and perhaps can't do, and I'll do so in the context of recent discussions over what the Detroit automotive manufacturers should have done. Chapter 11 is designed to do one thing well, and for the most part, it does so. And that is to rearrange the capital structure of companies with more debt than assets, so as to allow those that should survive to survive, and to allow those that should fail to fail. But it's important to remember that there's a difference between financial failure, that is, debts exceeding assets, and a business failure. Sometimes there's a financial failure without a business failure. Manville in uh, 1975 might have been a very efficient manufacturer of building supplies, but it was hopelessly insolvent, not because of its then business line, but because of tort liability associated with the manufacture of asbestos 20, 30, and 40 years earlier. Keeping the company going, which required realigning the claims against it and converting many of them to equity, that is stock rather than debt, uh, was the right result and Chapter 11 is designed to do just that. Conversely, one can have a business failure without a financial failure. Uh, my family had a business in Kalamazoo, Michigan, making gas lights 
at the turn of the 20th century, not a growth industry in a world of electric light bulbs, but the business was converted over the course of 50 years to one that makes pneumatic air cylinders because it was never faced with too much debt versus assets. But even in very large companies, oftentimes financial failure and business failure blend because the business model is wrong or because mistakes were made in the past that show up not just in terms of debt or because current management isn't up to the task. Before one can discuss a Detroit and bankruptcy, one needs to figure out which model it fits into. And I hasten to add, I think that's true of government bailouts as well. It would make no sense to bail out a failed restaurant that was operated by mom and pop. Mom and pop will leave the scene and someone else will take their place. Any intervention by bankruptcy would not only be odd, but it would probably make things worse. Now Detroit has a 40 year, perhaps longer history of things that in retrospect went wrong. Some, but by no means all, were caused by or could be blamed on then existing management. As a result of this long history over time, one or more of the manufacturers in Detroit today is almost certainly insolvent in the classic sense, that is, liabilities exceeding assets. Any solution to Detroit has to figure out how to get those things back in line. And I suppose giving them money from the government's one way to do that. The question is really, is that the best way? At a different level, uh, one or more of the manufacturers in Detroit are probably also no longer the efficient producers. Not necessarily because current management's incompetent, but because of the accretion of things that went wrong over the past 40 years have produced manufacturing operations that aren't quite as efficient as others. But the point is not to mention the past. More importantly, and I think what is often overlooked, the question here is what to do about the future. It's less important recriminating how we got into this mess than how we can get out of it in the best way possible. I'd like to start with what the fundamental issue is to me, which often seems to me to be too often ignored in the current debate. And that is, is there too much manufacturing capacity uh, going forward in the automotive industry? I'd say yes. Rather than a baseline of 16 or 17 million cars, we need to contemplate for quite a while a baseline of something around 12 or, uh, or 13 million cars. If that's so, then that is to me the gorilla in the corner. We need to pull huge capacity out of the system. We can take it out of one or more of the Detroit manufacturers, or we can take it across the board, but the capacity needs to come out. And we need to deal with the consequences of doing that, and it won't be pretty. It's going to require shutting down plants, car dealers, suppliers, and the like, and putting people out of work. Once one starts there, one can ask whether a bailout or bankruptcy is more likely to do that effectively. It is probably the case that if you decide to take it out of the automotive industry as a whole, across the board, then just out of, then rather than just Detroit, you will save jobs. But that is because my premise is that Detroit is less efficient than the rest of the industry, and any time you take jobs out of a company that is less efficient, you will probably save jobs, but it's an ironic idea, I think, because it always suggests closing down the most efficient first. Now, what's my claim about Detroit being less efficient? There are many, many ways to count it, but let me name just a few. A too many vehicle lines. The GM's the only manufacturer in the world that I can think of with more than three lines of cars in any one country. Too many dealers. Now, both of those are a consequence of the early to mid 20th century mergers. After all, it is General Motors. The consequence of a business model that worked in the 50s as when I was growing up, the idea was you started with a Chevy, you worked your way up the economic ladder, and got, as you did that, Pontiacs, Oldsmobiles, Buicks, and finally a Cadillac. And a franchise system that, under, by state law, unduly froze everything into place under that model, as well as other problems like a monopolistic response to foreign competition in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, there's today high labor costs, 
Detroit's labor costs are higher than other automotive manufacturers in this country. It isn't, you'll see a figure often citing $70 an hour versus $45 an hour. That's wrong, that figure mistakenly includes retiree pensions as a wage rather than as a fixed cost. But in reality, the difference is probably something like $55 an hour versus $45 an hour. That's a 20% difference and that's not peanuts. So with that as the starting point and Excuse the pun, your mileage may vary if you don't agree with it. Um, uh, and then the starting question of overcapacity, the question is, what about bankruptcy? Well, in the case of the automotive industry, bankruptcy, Chapter 11 in particular, does several things extraordinarily well and has a couple of um, important hurdles. Let's start with how bankruptcy could help Detroit. First, bankruptcy law allows the rejection of what lawyers call executory contracts and most of you would recognize as things such as leases, franchise agreements, supply contracts, labor contracts, and the like. That allows Detroit to convert many obligations, for example, to franchisees that are imposed by state law into unsecured claims against the company. Uh, parenthetically, in closing, Oldsmobile GM paid around $2 billion to dealers pursuant to these state laws, so it's not an inconsequential sum. I'd say that's plus one for bankruptcy. It allows the industry to probably reshape its pension obligations to retirees into unsecured claims to the extent they're not fully funded. Unlike current wages, an obligation to pension already retired people is a fixed cost that contributes to one or more of Detroit's manufacturers being insolvent. Bankruptcy's ability to deal with accrued pension obligations is, I would say, plus two for bankruptcy although I have to note it does so by probably shifting those liabilities to the Pension Gar Benefit Guarantee Corporation and thus to the population as a whole, which is going to be, end up being a hidden subsidy no matter what government does. Bankruptcy will allow a manufacturer to reject its labor contracts as well, although the union might uh, strike, but still the rejection of those contracts under the circumstances is probably a plus three for a bankruptcy. Finally, someone other than the current shareholders and their representatives who, when faced with insolvency, have a natural tendency to drag things out for too long, will be deciding on the appropriate size of those companies going forward. I put that as a plus four for bankruptcy. The biggest question mark for bankruptcy has to do with whether Chapter 11 is a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of the notion that no one will buy cars from a GM or Ford or Chrysler in bankruptcy. Most of the time we pay little or no attention to whether a company's in Chapter 11. We don't stop flying on United because it's reorganizing. We don't stop shopping at Bloomingdale's because it's reorganizing. But th that's because there we care really about the immediate thing we're, we're doing, a flight. We don't care about the future, so it doesn't really matter that the company's in bankruptcy. Now, that's not true for cars. We care about the warranty. It's not, I think, whether we'll get parts or services. I actually have little doubt that the businesses will spring up to provide that stuff. It's rather whether we can get that stuff as our original deal provided for free for a period of, say, five years. The economic value of that is probably, I can make up a number, it's around $1,000 or so. If you buy a car from GM after it files for Chapter 11, your warranty claim in bankruptcy lingo, while it has administrative expense priority in G GM's Chapter 11 proceeding, would only be an unsecured claim in any subsequent liquidation of GM. It isn't worth $1,000. Someone needs to figure out how to deal with that in bankruptcy. I've heard of government guarantees as a possible solution, but that is a large moral hazard problem. That is, if the government guarantees warranties, GM has a incentive now to scrimp a little bit on quality. Perhaps some sort of priority in any subsequent liquidation is a way to go. Even if that solved, the problem of warranties for people who bought GM cars before they filed for bankruptcy has to be addressed. Those warranty claims, if nothing's done, are unsecured claims in Chapter 11, and that would provoke, I predict, a huge outcry so that something would probably need to be done with the warranties for people who bought cars before Chapter 11. 11. Those are serious issues that require advanced thought and response. 
indeed the kind of response that I think GM and others should have been working on in terms of thinking about a prepackaged bankruptcy rather than putting all of their eggs into the bailout basket. But if I'm right about the overcapacity problem, Chapter 11 has a lot going forward, uh, a lot to say for it, and perhaps more than a government bailout. This isn't an exercise of imagining a perfect world. It's an exercise of comparing bankruptcy to alternatives, and most specifically, a government bailout. If nothing else, bankruptcy, by the self-selective nature of who will be using it, is much more likely to focus the solution to the excess capacity problem that I put at the root of this on the part of the industry that, that the excess capacity should come out of. That's again because we have a circumstance where, as I see it, the insolvent companies are also probably the late, least efficient producers. A bailout, on the other hand, is likely to underplay the excess capacity problem because dealing with it is so unpleasant and continue even with conditions the companies within a business line least deserving on almost any scale of continuation in anything like their present form. Even more frightening, uh, given what I've seen, are arguments that there's a role for the government to return us to a supposedly normal position of something like 16 million cars a year as the solution to the excess capacity problem. Now, to be sure, bankruptcy can't do it all. There is no gain saying that dislocations will be produced, not so much because of bankruptcy, but because of the underlying need to pull capacity out of the system. Dealing with dislocations seems to me to be a useful role for governments, and one that isn't talked about enough. The government, in my view, would be better off figuring out a good way of providing relief to those harmed by the transition rather than propping up a company in a business with excess capacity. Doing the latter, I think, only makes the temporary support ultimately permanent. Put another way, let bankruptcy do its work and deal with the issues of overcapacity through a thoughtful government response without sliding, out, sliding into a bailout solution that will either, I think, either ignore the problems of overcapacity or which or will respond to it by spreading it across all manufacturers. Anyway, my closing point is one really can't understand the dialogue about bailouts without understanding bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is an incredibly important and useful tool. Even though it operates company by company, it can also be used to pull excess capacity out of an entire industry. Think of airlines or steel. We hardly give it a second thought anymore when it's used to take out a linens and things because less efficient than Bed Bath & Beyond, or a Circuit City because less efficient than a Best Buy. While I'm sure there's a lot of mystique about automobiles, the what's good for General Motors is good for the U.S., I wonder if the trend for bailouts, and I see it as a trend, not just a once-in-a-lifetime response, is not as much a misunderstanding of the potentialities for bankruptcy as, as it is for the current government fashion for action. Bankruptcy may not always produce the right result, but it most certainly cannot if it's not understood and therefore not given the chance. The, this is a choice. You need to understand the various options that are on the table. We'll continue this discussion later. Thank you, Tom. Uh, one of the great pleasures of my job is getting to see where all the Simon degree takes people, uh, whether as an entrepreneur, uh, for example, one of the co-founders of MySpace, um, whether the CFO of the New York Times, whether the CEO of Goodyear. Uh, and even though we're very well known in the field of finance and accounting because of our economics analytical orientation, uh, the degree we found is very portable. One dramatic example is uh, our next speaker, who's an alum from our class in 1970, uh, went to Lafayette College before that, He's arguably one of the foremost uh, branding experts in the automobile industry. Uh, he has represented 11 different brands, both domestic and international. He's been the CEO of both Mazda North America and Land Rover North America. He introduced uh, the sport utility vehicle line uh, through his work at Land Rover. Built that from scratch in the late 80s in a period of a year and a half. Uh, developed a supplier and uh, distributor ne 
network and eventually grew that line to 22,000 unit sales per year. He's also a published author, recently uh, co-authored the book uh, Branding Iron. Uh, he's appeared on uh, national uh, news networks, uh, recently on Bloomberg, uh, in particular with discussions regarding the proposed automobile bailout. Uh, while uh, President Tom Jackson uh, mentioned that uh, it, we should think very actively about bankruptcy as an option, uh, Charlie, I think, will argue that uh, that option deserves careful consideration, and if anything, we shouldn't go there. So next, I uh, would like to introduce Charlie Hughes. Thank you, Mark, and good evening. My role tonight is to play Joe the plumber. Well, actually, more accurately, probably Joe the mechanic. This is a, a tale that's so old now it's not worth telling, but when I was going to graduate school here, uh, on the side I was modifying a 1963 Chevrolet Impala to drag race on the street. And uh, I guess my crowning achievement was teaching my wife to beat all the high school kids in that car. Now, as I've thought of this evening, I've been thinking about it in terms of three words. Bailout, bankruptcy, or bust. Not in terms of the car companies, rather in terms of our nation. We are a mess. Not just the banking industry, not the housing industry, not the car industry. No, the entire country. We are at, we are at a crossroads. Do we want to be a nation of builders? We're money launderers. Like you, I have high hopes for President Obama. Yet one can't help but wonder if he will be pragmatic and tough enough. We are, are on uncharted waters, and the stimulus package as it's now written today is a troubling start. Let's look at how we got here. We have a failed presidency, a Congress with approval ratings that would shame a child molester, a financial crisis born of slipshod government oversight and a widespread ethical meltdown in our financial industry. We have both states and a federal government that are dominated by special interests. Now, I don't know how many of you watched the congressional hearings where the car companies were taken in and taught a few lessons, uh, some of which they deserved. Uh, but if you were watching Nancy Pelosi, our Speaker of the House, she couldn't hold herself back from pushing her green agenda, even if it meant sinking our domestic car industry. And even President Obama is falling prey to this. He's only been in office two weeks, and already he's trying to get the, uh, the unions, the card check rule, which isn't even democratic. As a nation, we are like fourth generation heirs. We don't understand how the business works that made us wealthy. And we apparently don't understand how today's world operates. On too many issues, we are appallingly ignorant. We're mad at Detroit. During the hearings, six out of 10 constituents told their congressmen to let those dumb bastards die. How ignorant is that? In terms of Detroit, the car companies are far better than you think they are, but not yet good enough. So let's do a little fact check. What company runs the most efficient plant in North America? Ooh, ooh, I got it. It's the Chrysler Jeep plant in Toledo. And I might also add Chrysler, which is the company that's in the most trouble of the three, is tied for, with Toyota to run the most efficient plants across North America. What car company had the best J.D. Power rating for initial quality in mid-sized cars, which is the biggest segment and the most competitive segment? Chevrolet Malibu. Now, you're probably saying, fine, fluke. Toyota Camry was probably second, maybe Honda Accord. Nope, they were not second. And in fact, the Ford Fusion was third. What company had the most uh, Insurance Institute of Highway Safety highest ratings for crash safety? You're absolutely right, with 16 cars. Number two was Honda with 13. Who builds a large SUV hybrid that gets better mileage than a four-cylinder Toyota Camry? General Motors. Cadillac Escalade Hybrid. You can't get much bigger than that, and it gets 20 miles a gallon around town. 
what is the difference in pay for factory workers between Toyota and Ford? Right now, it actually is $9 an hour. But if you factor in the Toyota bonus, which they give to workers during a good year, by the way, they're not going to get that for last year. But if you factor in the typical bonus they've gotten over the last three years, the difference is less than $4 an hour. But here's the irony. What got GM in trouble are hubris and a quick fix mentality. As our government tosses around trillion dollar fixes, by the way, can any of you imagine a trillion dollars? Geez, when I was growing up, I thought a million dollars was a big deal. But as we're looking at these trillion dollar fixes, do the words hubris and quick fix come to mind? Starting with the credit crisis to the Wagner Labor Act, which was now only passed 1935, <laughs> CAFE and transplant factory tax subsidies, our government bears much responsibility for the state of our auto industry. So what to do? First, we've got to be like doctors. Do no harm. We will debate tonight whether the best approach is bankruptcy or bailout. But let's all keep in mind, this is not a lab experiment. And if we get it wrong, we're going to be in terrible trouble. Chapter 11 has never been tested on an industry that is so intertwined with our entire economy. Number two, we've got to start looking at treating the Detroit car companies as individual companies. Ford is in reasonably good shape. They have a good plan. They have a solid cash base. They haven't taken any money yet. But if they need it, we should support them. GM is in more trouble. Too much debt, too many brands, and they've already borrowed money. But that said, I can't imagine this country without them. And Chrysler? Chrysler cannot survive on its own. It needs to find a partner. Fiat has volunteered. And we should see whether that marriage can work. And our government should continue to support Chrysler until we find out. Now, if we are determined to push social, the social agendas of energy independence and climate control, let's do it with street smarts and guts. Let's raise the federal tax. We saw what that did for uh, the way we bought cars over the past summer. Let's have one set of regulations for emissions and fuel economy nationwide. How arrogant is it for people to want their own emission standard in each state? And let's rush, and I do mean rush, to harmonize those standards with Europe. Think of the powerful platform you'd have if those standards were the same in what's basically 70% of the car market worldwide to go to India and China where the real pollution is occurring and talk to them about it. And finally, let's make sure that in terms of our industry we, that we believe in fair trade, not one-way free trade. Since World War II, every economy that we would consider to be an economic powerhouse has cultivated a strong home-based car industry. Germany, France, Japan, Korea, and now China. See, the auto industry is the springboard to economic growth, not just for the jobs or the exports, but because the foundation of their technological development in these countries, and ours as well, I might add, is the auto industry. During the congressional hearings in December, Silicon Valley came in to support Detroit, saying that if one or two of the domestic car companies went out of business, at least two of the big names in technology in this country would be in Chapter 11 very shortly. I've worked for eight car companies. Some of you probably think I can't hold a job, but I worked at one of them for 14 years. Six of them were imports from Germany, Italy, Britain, and Japan. And I consulted for the Koreans. They fiercely fight for the success of their homegrown car companies in ways that we don't fully appreciate. Their car companies are vitally important to them, and they play the game as a team sport. Sad to say, we are a world champion athlete going to seed. We've gambled our money away, and we are left staring at our gambling debts. We are at a crossroads. Do we want to be a nation of builders or money launderers? Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Our next speaker is uh, the Gleason Professor of Business Administration at the Simon School. He's an accomplished scholar in organizational economics, in competition policy, 
in corporate governance and compensation policy. He's one of the co-authors of the leading textbook on organizational architecture. He's also a beloved teacher on our campus, having been a past recipient of our highest teaching award. He's done extensive service as a consultant to law firms and to a variety of corporations on topics like organizational uh, economics, franchising, valuation, and antitrust issues. He's going to argue now that uh, while bailouts may be appropriate for certain industries like banking, they're not the right solution to the automobile industry. And also how bankruptcy has some unique virtues when it comes to dealing uh, with state franchising laws. would like to welcome uh, Jim Brickley. Well, I've been out in the um, audience uh, quite a few times uh, being, uh, having season tickets to the Jiva uh, series, but, uh, you know, I usually watch fiction when I'm out there, and unfortunately, uh, that is not our topic today. We're talking about uh, nonfiction and uh, a serious topic. But um, let me begin by saying, first of all, that, uh, you know, I agree that the automobile industry is clearly very important, uh, you know, in the United States. Uh, it employs directly close to two million uh, people, you know, in manufacturing, uh, service sales, and, and others, other occupations. Uh, certainly supports um, a lot of jobs, and beyond that, and certainly has been important to our R and D uh, effort nationally as well as our GDP. Uh, that said, and I, I agree that you know General Motors and others have had some successes in. There, uh, in some of the things that they've tried to do, but there's also some serious structural uh, problems in this industry, and then the question becomes, you know, what is the best way to handle it? Is it best to handle it uh, through a bailout uh, of some type, or uh, you know, through uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy? Uh, we all hope, uh, you know, productive solutions are uh, ultimately found to this uh, to this problem. Now, um, one of the things that uh, people often question is, you know, why would the government, you know, be quick to bail out a bank or a financial institution and not be so quick to uh, bail out the uh, automobile industry? And, uh, you know, the questions are, aren't they both important? Uh, you know, if management screwed up in one case, you know, haven't they screwed up in the other as well? And the answer, I believe, you know, to why or the rationale for this for this differential treatment is that these industries are fundamentally different in terms of how they affect the overall economy and also on how best it might be, uh, you know, the solution that might be best in terms of dealing with them. Uh, it's more complicated when you talk about restructuring uh, financial institutions. Now, in terms of, let me first start by talking a little bit about the banking and financial system. I think it's important to, you know, talk about why we, you know, we treat that or why we might want to bail that out the way we do. Um, I would compare the uh, financial system and the banking system in the country to like the heart and circulatory system in a, in a person. You know, people can't survive without, you know, proper blood supply uh, to their organs. And uh, similarly, a, an economy can't prosper without, uh, you know, if there's a disruption in the uh, flow of, flow of uh, credit and funds. If you think about it, virtually every business in this country, in fact, many around the world, uh, depend on financial institutions uh, to finance their operations and uh, investments. All deal with banks and all deal with, or many deal with other financial institutions. We as consumers, in turn, use banks for you know, our depository services, for obtaining our own credit, for making our investments, and many other financial services. Now, when you start having failure in major banks and financial institutions, uh, it can send sh shock waves through the economy that can lead to a lack of confidence in the entire uh, financial system and other financial institutions, which can yield, basically produce widespread financial uh, panic. Another effect that I think we're even becoming more conscious of now is this domino effect that seems to be present. You know, consider the bailout of the large insurance company, you know, AIG, by the federal government. This company had issued literally or sold billions of dollars of credit insurance 
uh, to other financial institutions. If they started to default on that, what that means is some of the institutions that had bought that insurance would then default on their obligations, and you have this domino effect that runs through the uh, financial system. When it comes to uh, the financial system of the world, you know, the statement that the world is quite flat is indeed uh, quite correct. So if the financial panic and systematic failures of leading financial institution, institutions can clearly impede the flow of funds in the economy, as we as investors withdraw our funds and are afraid to use these institutions, and as the uh, banks themselves become reluctant to loan money to each other, to businesses, and uh, to consumers, and essentially all sectors of the economy are affected negatively when their so-called financial blood supply uh, is cut off. Um, you can see this readily in the effects that, you know, in terms of the stock market and the credit crunch that followed uh, the problems that Bear Stearns had, as well as uh, Lehman Brothers and others. Now, as I've discussed, the automobile industry is clearly very important. Uh, failures in this industry clearly will be harmful uh, and have bad effects on many people. Uh, other automobile industry uh, related companies will be affected, as will the overall economy. However, allowing a large manufacturing company to file for bankruptcy and reorganization, even one as large as GM, I would argue, would not have the devastating system-wide effects that would occur if the government allowed uh, companies like AIG, Chase, Bank of America, and so on to default on their uh, obligations. Now, the other, other thing I want to talk a little bit about is analysts often focus on uh, unions, labor costs, uh, debt, you know, in discussing the problems of the big three auto companies. Another important uh, topic that Tom Jackson uh, referred to is uh, the need to reduce the number of brands and models and to improve the efficiency of the distribution system. And um, I agree with the position that uh, Tom put forth that many of these issues are likely to be effectively dealt with better through bankruptcy than through bailouts. Um, the big three automobile companies developed their product lines and dealer networks when they dominated the U.S. automobile market. You know, I remember when I was a kid when they basically, you know, were the market. I'm not a kid anymore, and, you know, they don't dominate uh, the market any longer. Um, and it's widely acknowledged that these companies now have far too many brands, dealers, uh, and models given their current market share, which is collectively less than 50% of the U.S. market. Um, let me just give you some figures. Currently, the big three market 112 different car and truck models in the U.S. through 15 different brands. In contrast, you look at the major competitors, the top three Japanese companies, and they offer only about half the choices. Indeed, General Motors by itself has more uh, models and brands than all of the Japanese automobile companies combined. Um, the big three also have far too many dealers. General Motors currently has something like 6,700 dealers in this country who operate uh, 14,000 uh, franchise uh, agreements or contracts. Its closest competitor, or Toyota, has only 1,200 dealers with just 1,600 franchises. That's about 90% uh, fewer franchises than General Motors. Now, the automobile companies, the analysts, and many observers have argued, you know, it's imperative that these companies, uh, the big three, cut their dealers, a number of dealers, and their brands, and their models. Um, unfortunately, that's not going to be easy to do under the current regulatory structure. Uh, automobile uh, dealers are very powerfully politic are very powerful politically, uh, especially at the local and state levels. And through time, they have secured onerous protective legislation in almost all states. Uh, the, uh, the, and these laws make it very expensive for automobile companies to make changes in their product lines, uh, distribution systems, uh, doing such things as discontinuing brands or closing or combining uh, dealerships. I think Tom mentioned that you know, in one recent experience, it cost General Motors uh, more than a uh, billion dollars, maybe as much as two, to discontinue Oldsmobile. And you might expect to see similar 
uh, types of expenses as they do further changes of this type. Now, in the case of bankruptcy, all of the company's dealer contracts become subject to cancellation and restructuring. Um, and as a result, uh, it become, they have a lot more flexibility in changing both and both changing their uh, product lines as well as their uh, dealership systems in a timely fashion. Now, it has been noted that the number of American car dealers is falling daily. You know, it's uh, every day or every like you see some uh, dealership uh, collapse or fail, but relying on local business failures to reduce the number of dealers, you know, I don't think is a good way to address the basic problem, uh, which re requires systematic and well-planned changes in the company's product lines and dealership systems. Now, I might add that uh, state dealership protection laws don't only make it expensive for uh, the auto companies to alter their dealership contracts, they also prevent manufacturers from owning their own dealerships directly and in, many, uh, in most states and marketing directly to consumers through various media like the Internet. And uh, a number of these companies have tried uh, some innovative things over the Internet, for example, only to be challenged uh, by lawsuits from dealers and uh, by uh, regulatory action. Um, I have studied, as uh, Mark said, uh, franchising quite a bit, franchise contracts, and, in dealer, and indeed dealership uh, protection laws across a broad range of industries. And my research indicates that these laws essentially lead to less efficient distribution systems and a destruction of value. Uh, consistent with my research, the FTC, in fact, uh, did a study a number of years ago looking at state laws that prevent automobile manufacturers from owning their dealerships directly, and uh, they estimated that it costs consumers billions of dollars a year in higher automobile prices. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm suggesting that all of the dealerships should be owned by the big three. I don't think that's the case at all, but uh, in certain cases, it does make sense, and I would like to see them have the flexibility to do that. Now, in my view, it's unrealistic to expect uh, 50 state legislatures to reform these laws, uh, you know, facing local political pressure, uh, so I would be very pleased to see the federal government uh, consider and look at this issue and perhaps adopt uh, you know, federal legislation that would uh, uh, give more flexibility to the, uh, these companies in terms of the contracts that they design and the distribution systems that um, they have. Um, just as a, uh, as a note, you know, I look at the politics involved with franchise uh, regulation, and I have studied the effects and have, am convinced that you know, a lot of inefficiency is being generated by uh, this type of action. And this is just one example. It, it does strike me that if you start talking about restructuring of the automobile industry, you're talking about lots of winners, you're talking about lots of uh, losers as well, and uh, it's going to be a lot of tough political choices. And so when you start throwing that in, you know, to the hands of a politically motivated car czar or politicians, you know, I worry about um, economics getting trumped by uh, politics, and, you know, frankly, I'd like to see this dealt with uh, economically than politically. So, thank you. Our fourth speaker is an Simon alum from the class of 1980. Uh, as you can see in the description, he's literally seen and done it all when it comes to bankruptcy. Uh, bankruptcy, like uh, business school applications, is a negative beta industry. Uh, when the market's up, uh, applications tend to go down and bankruptcy cases tend to go down. Uh, but when the market's down, applications go in the reverse direction, as does uh, the amount of attention and effort devoted to bankruptcy. Uh, he's dealt with uh, Ponzi schemes. Uh, he's operated uh, airlines, retailers, restaurants. He's dealt with complex reorganization cases uh, involving such names as Planet Hollywood, Brothers Gourmet Coffee, and the Discovery Zone. Uh, he's graciously agreed to join us today in the midst of uh, pretty intense times uh, for his business. He's the partner at Tabus, uh, Friedman, Soloff, and Miller. And to join us from Southern Florida, where his uh, firm is headquartered, Joel Tabus. <laughs> 
thank you, Dean. And I, I want to thank the school for uh, allowing me to participate. Um, professor Smith was my finance professor when I was in the MBA program. And President Jackson wrote the bankruptcy treatise we all used in law school, Mayor Jackson. So this is a, a big pleasure for me. Um, as President Jackson mentioned, my view is that it's very important to understand the ramifications of what will happen, what can happen in a bankruptcy, in evaluating any kind of distressed corporate situation, and especially the one the auto industry is uh, facing right now. Um, and while many people have an aversion to the word bankruptcy and think that it is the death knell of many companies and there are statistical analyses that show not a whole lot of companies do survive bankruptcy. I would submit to you that the companies that do not successfully reorganize are the ones that don't plan and consider the potential benefits of bankruptcy prior to going into bankruptcy and they're the ones that just react. So. About 90% of all companies that do go into a bankruptcy proceeding, a Chapter 11 proceeding for reorganization, do not succeed and they end up liquidating. About 10% do succeed, but those are the ones who've planned for it properly, considered the ramifications, utilized the tools available in a bankruptcy proceeding, and emerged successfully. Um, I also want to thank the school for, for making me feel at home because down in, in Miami we're dealing with an incredibly distressed real estate market and, and the stage here just <laughs> makes me feel right in the middle of all the cases I'm working on right now. Um, when you're negotiating with your creditors in a distressed situation prior to bankruptcy, any time you go into negotiations you have to know what you can make that creditor do and what you can not make that creditor do in a bankruptcy proceeding. And most of the times when the negotiations are getting heated, when I'm trying to convince the other side of the rationale of the position I'm taking, I take the time to set them down and I explain to them exactly what can happen to them in a bankruptcy. And as President Jackson mentioned, you can convert the nature and the essence of claims in bankruptcy. So, in other words, what can happen to a creditor's claim? They can lose their right to collect their money. They can lose their right to sue. They're relegated to just filing a proof of claim. And ultimately, if the restructuring professionals have done their job in a Chapter 11 proceeding, that creditor may see its claim converted to that of a shareholder. So there's a lot of very important tools that have to be considered. Um, the other thing that I believe is a, a very important element of the bankruptcy proceeding, um, which I submit is probably going to be a very, very difficult task facing the automakers at this point in time, is that when you're dealing with large numbers of creditors who are dispersed around the country, who have the potential for venue in various courts around the country, you're going to be facing astronomical legal fees, expenses, and coordination efforts. One of the really great aspects of a bankruptcy proceeding is the debtor files a bankruptcy in one particular forum, and all of the disputes are then focused, for the most part, there are exceptions, but for the most part, in that forum. So instead of General Motors, for instance, facing litigation throughout the country over franchise um, disputes, it can and will be dealing with litigation in one forum, wherever the bankruptcy is filed, with all of those franchisees. So that is an extraordinary benefit that bankruptcy brings to a situation like this. It focuses the efforts, you avoid the potential for inconsistent consequences, and in fact it will usually result in some sort of cost savings for the other side as well, for the franchisees. Because for instance, one of the things that happens in many big bankruptcy cases early on is under certain provisions of the bankruptcy code, similarly situated constituents are 
uh, allowed to form what are called committees. So for instance, some of you who've witnessed large bankruptcy proceedings may have seen in big cases in Delaware or New York, um, and, and that was how I got involved in the Planet Hollywood case that Dean mentioned. Creditors committees will be formed, and we were on the committee of unsecured creditors uh, in the Planet Hollywood case. And what those people do in that committee function is they almost act like board of directors. Uh, they have fiduciary obligations to their constituents who are all similarly situated unsecured creditors. They're not supposed to be using the um, platform for personal gain, their, their particular claim. They're supposed to be looking out for everyone. They hire professionals, uh, attorneys and accountants to help them review, and they get input into the managerial decisions that are made. And I would submit to you it's a very, very important and critical feature of the bankruptcy process that does not necessarily or at all exist outside of bankruptcy. And I, I personally am a proponent of having the people with the economic interests involved in that manner, in that fashion. And uh, I would submit that they're also better able to help fashion how the company will go forward than the typical regulator regulator uh, who has the regulatory agenda, which isn't necessarily always going to be consistent with the financial interests of all the various constituents of the enterprise. Um, the other benefit that the auto manufacturers will get is when a bankruptcy petition is filed, um, there is a section of the bankruptcy code which prohibits lawsuits from continuing. It's called the automatic stay. So. What that does for a company in a distressed situation is it gives it a breathing spell. Uh, it gives them a respite from lawsuits that are going on and it enables it to focus on the things that need to be focused on to make sure that the company can succeed or to make the determination that it can't and there is no ongoing enterprise value. That's another important benefit of uh, a bank bankruptcy proceeding. Um, Something else that's been in the news with regards to some of the bailout um, reports that have been coming out is complaints about executive bonuses and, and compensation. Another important feature of bankruptcy code is under 327 through 330, early on in the proceedings, all of the top executives basically have to submit their compensation packages for approval by the court and vetting by the creditor constituents. Um, so this brings everything out in the daylight. Um, earlier in this decade, I uh, used to typically see people filing for compensation pa packages with golden parachutes. Um, the courts have now prevented that for a large, to a large extent. And you kind of nip the whole problem, which we, we now are facing in reverse, but you nip the entire problem with overpaid executives uh, in the bud early on and it gets vetted and litigated in the bankruptcy process. Um, as has been discussed as well and as I mentioned a little bit, um, various states have different laws with extreme penalties for the manufacturers vis-a-vis um, -vis disputes they may have with franchisees. Uh, we, we've been involved with a few Ford franchisees down in the Miami area, which recently shut down. And I can tell you that they're all struggling. Um, it's it's going to be a difficult situation, and it's going to be a widespread situation if the economy stays the way it seems it's going to stay for a while. And again, not only will there be significant damages related to those issues, but um, if the bankruptcy is filed for the manufacturers, those issues again can be litigated in one forum. Everyone can be treated similarly. There can even be a committee for the franchisees so they can have an economic voice. And indeed, it's entirely foreseeable that they'll also become uh, equity security holders um, at the end of any kind of successful reorganization process. Um, Another good aspect of the bankruptcy proceeding is the ability to um, get transparency in the process. As I've already mentioned, for instance, executive compensation usually has to be submitted to courts for approval. 
Likewise, professional fees have to be submitted on a periodic basis for approval with the courts as well. Um, that's not necessarily a feature that you're going to see in state court litigation. And while I've seen studies suggesting that the costs of a bankruptcy proceeding in terms of professional fees would be um, much, much, much more significant than outside of a bankruptcy, I think that there are certain aspects of, of those proceedings which aren't incorporated into those analyses, and I would submit there would be a cost savings, not only from the debtor side, but also from the creditor side because of the representation of committees, which I mentioned. Uh, the other aspect of a bankruptcy proceeding that will facilitate information flow is uh, Rule 2004 of the Bankruptcy Rules. Um, what that is, is it's akin to having the ability uh, for a party in interest, a creditor, an equity security holder, um, or the government who participated in most bankruptcies through the uh, Justice Department and the Office of the U.S. Trustee to obtain financial information from the debtors or information about how they're planning to restructure and rehabilitate the debtors um, because you're allowed to take depositions. A bankruptcy proceeding is a court proceeding. You have certain mechanisms and features and remedies available to you which are not available outside of a bankruptcy proceeding in an out-of-court workout or a bailout situation. Um, I would also submit that there's been years and years and years of litigation in a high-profile cases on many complex issues which are now going to be facing, facing the manufacturers of, of uh, the automobiles in our country. And there is a very well-established um, set of case law and dynamics and parameters which are considered by the courts in arriving at the judgments they make which either lead to a reorganization process or don't. So you have a very well-developed area of the law um, which will not be available in an out-of-court situation. Um, the other benefit, um, as I mentioned, is going to be you have constituents who are going to have sophisticated representation. They're going to be able to pool the representation in the forms of committees. And the committees and the other constituents with um, the financial interests are going to be the ones nego negotiating the features of the company which emerges from a bankruptcy and how that company's finances, profiles, and capital structure are going to look. And I have found it to be a very, very good process for reworking and restructuring most companies because oftentimes there'll be someone with a certain type of financial interest, say someone who's been entrenched in management for years, and it, you know, it's, it's always a tough thing for someone to admit they've taken the wrong tack or that their, their uh, management strategies haven't worked or that they shouldn't be given another chance. And while the process can sometimes get a little heated and hostile, um, I've found that the adversary process often yields a, a very good compromise or a very good result. And the confirmation process, which can be uh, heated and lit um, litigated significantly, and that's, that's a process by which the plan of reorganization uh, emerges and the company emerges from court, is a very good one. Uh, in terms of getting things straightened out and getting all constituents' concerns considered. Um, another important feature, I think, relates also to the government's bailout efforts, and that feature involves how new debt um, incurred by a bankrupt debtor is treated after the bankruptcy. And there's a one code provision, which is Section 364 of the code, which governs how a uh, debtor can borrow money. And in the bailout scenario, which is, is being considered, um, I, I would say it would mo be most akin to Section 364D of the code, which deals with a creditor coming in in a situation where the capital markets have failed. And I think, in my opinion, is the capital markets are not going to be giving money to the big three, which is why they're going to the government here. So they can't raise equity. They can't raise debt. But in a bankruptcy, when you're facing that situation, and it's crucial, and there are some safeguards you can afford to creditors whose, whose claims will be diluted or relegated to a lower priority. You can go to the court and say, I need priority financing. I need super priority financing. I need financing which is going to come ahead of my other secured creditors who already exist in my capital structure. Here's why I need it. Here's how they're going to be um, adequately protected in the event you give me this financing. And 
those types of considerations are things that we face in bankruptcy all the time, and there are types of considerations and safeguards and, and other um, aspects of the bailout financing which is being considered right now by the government. So there are a number of features that, in my view, um, would be much, much more well handled in a bankruptcy scenario. And as President Jackson intimated, it's important for the auto manufacturers to all be considering these issues. And there's another important feature of why that is. If the board of directors, if the officers and directors of these companies do not consider bankruptcy and the companies fail or don't succeed, a very fertile, fertile area of law right now is director and officer suits. And what those suits say is when a company's in the zone of insolvency, it has certain fiduciary duties which shift from the shareholders to the creditors. And if you breached your duty by taking a course of action in terms of reorganization or workout or didn't consider bankruptcy, which could have saved the enterprise value of the company, you could be facing a director and officer suit. So uh, my, my view is the manufacturers need to carefully consider the ramifications in their negotiations. It's probably going to be something that's going to benefit them. It's going to be helpful in terms of bad press for marketing purposes, I would submit there's a lot of bad press for marketing purposes out there right now. Companies survive bankruptcy if they employ the tools and plan for them properly. Batting cleanup tonight on our panel is the Louise and Henry Epstein Professor of Finance, Cliff Smith. Uh, Cliff is an accomplished scholar. Uh, he's an editor uh, both with the Journal of Risk and Insurance and the Journal of Financial Economics, uh, the top uh, finance journal that's uh, headquartered at the Simon School. He's published 16 books, 90 uh, different articles. He won a major prize a year ago for impact on the field of insurance. And uh, he's also a very accomplished uh, teacher. Uh, there are Hall of Fames around the world, and we know of the one in Cooperstown, uh, probably less well known as uh, the one in, near Syracuse for boxing. I uh, used to live in a, a place in Arizona that had the Handball Hall of Fame. It was just in uh, uh, near Orlando, and there's a water skiing Hall of Fame. There is no uh, business school teaching Hall of Fame, uh, but I would argue that Rochester and the Simon School would be a wonderful home for it. And if uh, we have an inaugural class of inductees uh, to the Business Teaching Hall of Fame, Cliff would certainly be in, be in that class. He's won our full-time MBA teaching award 10 times, our EMBA teaching award 19 times, Cliff Smith. I'm going to do my best to stay away from behind that whale. I, uh, I'm more of a pacer, I'm sorry. Uh, like Jim, it's, uh, it's awfully good to be here. Uh, usually I'm on the other side of the, the, the lights. Uh, we've been subscribers to Jiva for three decades, and uh, uh, I, I'm certainly appreciative of what they do for the arts community, uh, but uh, allowing us to use this facility is uh, really special. Uh, thank you, Jeeva. Um, you know, you, you, you hear people say that people that don't study history are destined to repeat whatever mistakes uh, have been made. So I thought it might take uh, might be useful for us to take just a minute and and look at some historical precedent and try and and glean some lessons from the historical record. Uh, when you talk about bailouts in the auto industry, uh, people in the U.S. regularly look at Chrysler, say they got in trouble in the late 70s. The government came in, put a bailout package together. It involved uh, an array of things, including loan guarantees. Uh, Chrysler got their act together, things worked out wonderfully. Uh, gosh, why don't we just do it again? Um, that, you say it fast, you don't think about it very hard, that sounds good. Um, I'd like to remind you that Chrysler wasn't the only bailout that we lived through in the 70s. Uh, anybody here remember the savings and loan industry? 
you know, I mean, here was a group of guys, they got in trouble, they went to Congress, uh, government said, uh, here, uh, let's, uh, let's bail you out. And uh, my, my memory's fading a little as I advance in years. Uh, I, I'm losing more than just uh, the stuff on the top of my head. Uh, and, and, but, 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 but my memory seems to be that that one didn't turn out quite as well as the, the, the Chrysler case. So I guess the first historical lesson that I'd like to point out to you is that bailouts are risky. And in that sense, having an outcome like the Chrysler outcome is something that at least in part depends on luck. Now, if you're sitting here in this audience and you think that counting on being lucky is an appropriate strategy for weathering this current financial storm, I'd like to recommend that on your way home this evening you stop by the 7-Eleven. They've got an impressive array of quite innovative lotto products. And if you want to count on being lucky, you know, all it takes is a dollar and a dream. Um, <clears throat> you know, you go back and you look at Auto Week's description of Chrysler's success in dealing with their bailout. And you'll see articles in the late 70s, early 80s about Chrysler's bold, new, innovative models. You know, things like mm, minivans. Uh, as a finance professor, I hear bold, new, innovative, and to me, as a finance professor, it sounds like risky, risky, risky. <laughs> And, and, and so that leads to an interesting kind of issue. I think that when the political process is unfolding and people are saying, well, look at the cost that we're forecasting for this bailout, and clearly the U.S. auto industry is worth more than that, you want to be really careful because those costs are regularly understated by scary amounts. And one of the reasons that those cost estimates are understated is because the behavior of the firms that are granted these bailouts change. They are, in a sense, given the opportunity to play poker with somebody else's money. And, and trust me, if you're ever invited to a poker game and you're allowed to play with somebody else's money, double the bets. <laughs> Bringing out risky new products is one way you can do it. Before Chrysler got that bailout package in the 70s, what did product warranties in the auto industry look like? They were 12 months and 12,000 miles. After Chrysler's debt was guaranteed by us, the taxpayers, guess what Chrysler management decided to do with Chrysler product warranties? Five years, 50,000 miles. Now, it turned out that those bold new products generally were well received and well produced and so those warranty claims didn't eat us out of house and home. But think about this from Chrysler's perspective. Well, we're going to try something that's bold, new, and innovative. If it works, we're heroes. If it doesn't work, we're giving it to the treasury. This is like flipping a coin where Heads I win, tails you lose. So, the second lesson from history that I'd like to share with you is that 
bailouts allow you to play poker with the taxpayers' money, and those are precisely the kinds of places where you expect the size of the bet to get raised. I guess the third thing that I'd like to point out is that the forecasted duration of this bailout is something that can easily shift on you. The end of World War II. You know, during the Second World War, most of the agricultural industry in Europe, wheat fields got turned into battlefields. There were draft deferments that were granted to farmers. Roosevelt told the domestic agricultural industry, you need to crank up production and feed the Allies. And they did. They did a marvelous job. What happened at the end of the Second World War? What happened after VE Day? Well, all of those European battlefields got turned back into wheat fields, and there was a massive increase in the supply of agricultural products. What did that imply about these U.S. agricultural workers that had been largely unsung heroes? Granted, they had draft deferments. Nobody was shooting at you riding around on a tractor like they were my dad in a foxhole in Italy. But... That's a different story. These farmers were facing tough times. This huge increase in global agricultural supply meant prices crashed. Politically, we were at a crossroads with respect to the agricultural industry. One thing we could do, <laughs> we could let markets work. If you did, a year, two, maybe three, agricultural prices would be low. Farmers would have a tough row to hoe. You'd have people leaving that industry. Of course, who would leave? Well, the people with the most opportunities other places, the people with the most flexibility. You'd have younger farmers leaving, older farmers staying, people that had college degrees and more opportunities in other industries would be more likely to go. But after a year, two, three, these wrenching adjustments would have occurred and we'd be back operating. Or we could decide to bail out the agricultural industry in the U.S. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, you know how that one turned out. We decided to pay farmers not to produce. And that happened in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. And, and guess what? We're still doing it today. Thinking that this bailout of the auto industry is something that we're going to do and be done with those costs of the bailout can be massively understated because this can turn into an annuity. Bailout advocates in Congress regularly tell you, <laughs> well, look, we're not planning on just handing a suitcase full of money to General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. What we're going to do is we're going to put constraints on what they can do. <laughs> Nancy Pelosi wants more green cars. And she ain't just talking about painting them green. <laughs> we're going to put constraints on how they can pay people. We're going to put constraints on what dividend policy they can make. We're going to put constraints on how they can finance things. Let's see. Let's let the government run an industry. Gosh, that's worked out so well in the past. There's Fannie Mae, there's Freddie Mac, there's the U.S. Postal Service. Yeah, right. The fourth lesson that I'd suggest that looking at history my suggest is the government ain't that damn good at running businesses. <laughs>
know, the, the, the last thing that I'd like to share with you is that, you know, we heard a little earlier that the auto industry is a huge part of the U.S. economy. It's an incredibly important industry in the U.S. economy. And we've never had a bankruptcy that applied to an industry that, that, was, that was that large, that was that important, that that was integrated in our economy. And this is just too big to run as an experiment. Now, at first I thought, well, my goodness, you know, have we bailed out an industry that's that large, that's important? That, and it struck me, yes, we had. Well, this is the royal we, not here in the U.S., but they did it in the U.K. And, oh yeah, that didn't work out so well. What we're dealing with here is an incredibly important set of problems. And what we're going to do is turn things over to a little more free-flowing opportunity for questions and answers. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Cliff. Let me invite the other panelists to join us on the stage. We've collected some questions. Uh, we're distributing cards if you'd like to add questions to the mix. And we'll start with the first one. Uh, hindsight's always 20-20, uh, uh, but would like to ask the panelists, uh, maybe Tom, uh, Joel, uh, in particular, uh, should Lehman Brothers have been forced to go bankrupt? I think any time you're looking at a um, financial institution of that sort, it's much more complex. Um, in part, if you look at the bankruptcy code, in fact, true financial institutions, banks can't use bankruptcy. They need to go through some other regulatory process. Um, Lehman Brothers, and I tend to hear uh, agree a fair amount with Jim, is that it's, it's tied in in such an important way with a financial infrastructure and a financial infrastructure uh, resonates throughout the economy very differently than, than, than other places. I think they probably should have rec rescued it instead of let it go. I think they learned a lesson. I think that is hindsight. Um, and I think it, 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 it was too quick to believe that this was the last one and that we could survive it. We quickly learned we couldn't, so we went back to a model of, of, of stepping in, and I think that was probably Um, next question. Banks have taken federal monies that have only seemed to shore up their ratios. When do you see the banks looking at lending and investment into other companies? Cliff? Um, you know, banks are making loans right now if you're DuPont. Uh, Wall Street will take uh, debt to public markets if you've got a triple A credit rating. Uh, I mean, what has happened here and what happens in virtually every one of these kinds of financial dislocations is credit spreads rise dramatically. So where the curtailing of access to credit has been most pronounced has been people with weaker credits. And that, there's a lot of uncertainty about exactly how long this process is going to take, uh, how much collateral lies behind the particular business model that a firm has. So if you're a, a startup company with little in the way of tangible assets and not much of a track record, you're going to have a heck of a time showing up at a bank or an investment bank and raising debt capital. If you're a, a, a firm with very high credit ratings and a lot of tangible assets and a long track record, 
uh, you can show up at virtually any financial institution around and arrange a loan relatively quickly. <clears throat> Charlie. I'd like to jump in here because I, I think we're avoiding the big issue with banks, and that is the banks, as they look at each other, don't even believe the balance sheets. So banks aren't going to loan to banks. <clears throat> and we have two models. One is Japan and one is Sweden. The Japanese model avoided trying to clean up these balance sheets. The Swedes said, we've got to consolidate banks. We've got to clean up these balance sheets. One country came back pretty quickly, and one was in a recession for, oh, gee, just 10 years. So until we step up, it was, it was good that the government pumped some cash in and kept a few other people from collapsing. But we're avoiding the big issue. You can't have a banking system where no one trusts the balance sheet, where the balance sheets are opaque, even to other banks. It's like liar's poker. If I could add from my own experience, uh, some of the local banks in Miami who I represent, the new loans they're making are down about 90%. And many of those loans in Miami, for instance, are real estate based, as I, I mentioned in my intro. Uh, one of the problems is appraisers now are reluctant to place values on real estate. And for instance, <laughs> one of my best buddies is a, a very well-known uh, appraiser down in Miami. He refuses to appraise residential real estate because our residential real estate prices on single family homes have plummeted about 40% on average. Uh, condominiums are 50% or more. So you, you have situations where, because of what's going on with the real estate market, the banks are having to write down their assets. One local bank had to write down its real estate based assets from about $6 billion to $4 billion. So they're out of formula and out of ratio in terms of their capital requirements. It makes it difficult for them to make loans, and it's kind of a self perpetuating problem and, and you know it's I think it's one of the problem was created because our real estate market for instance always scared me a bit as it was heating up in 04 and 05 and my view of it is it's, it's never as good as it looks when it's going down up and it's never quite as bad as it looks when it's going down but people overreact both ways and right now people are not going into the banks to borrow money yeah, I, I, I think if you think of cleaning up the bank's balance sheets, it's sort of necessary but not sufficient. Even if you clean up the bank's balance sheets, the banks still have to look out at the people that are borrowing the money and deciding whether to lend them the money or not, and things look awfully murky to them out there. They're, they're having hard times getting people to step up and make appraisals on the properties and everything else. So it actually wasn't a big surprise to me that when the banks got some of the bailout money that they got, that the lending didn't sort of suddenly shoot up from those banks because because, frankly, even if you clean up all the balance sheets of all the banks, uh, they're going to look out there and figure out who can they trust and what, what, what numbers can they trust out there in terms of the people who are trying to borrow from them. So this is a very complicated, multifaceted um, problem of which I think the bank, cleaning up the balance sheets of the bank is, is a necessary but not sufficient step. Well, and, and one of the things that I think you, you need to think about as a larger backdrop here is what banks have a comparative advantage in doing. Uh, ultimately, if you're a very transparent business with lots of tangible assets, easily valued, uh, good credit rating, uh, th those are things that are much easier to take to Wall Street and package as a public debt issue. Uh, banks have historically dealt more with more opaque customers. And it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really what their bread and butter always has been, uh, even more so when you start talking about uh, regional banks and community banks. Uh, so this idea about uh, cleaning up bank balance sheets and banks trusting each other, th th there's, there's a real issue about exactly how... Th this is something that has to be thought about in degrees, not, uh, not as uh, something that's, that's ever going to be completely transparent. Uh, easily 
verified and valued. Jim, let me just add, uh, you know, one thing about I mean, this is an incredibly difficult time to do business in and to value. I mean, look at the stock market. I remember, you know, not so long ago where, you know, one or two percent move in the stock market, you know, you kind of go, geez, it really moved a lot today, you know, and with all the uncertainty that we have in terms of the economy, uh, you know, what the government's going to do, uh, and so on, it's, uh, you see these swings of like five percent, ten percent, and that's just reflective, I think, of it's a difficult uh, time to do business. It's hard to value and know, you know, what the uh, value of an investment is. And I think uh, somehow this has to, you know, through uh, uh, time and, and through appropriate efforts, come down to a more normal environment. It, that's, it's hard right now. Next question. Does reduction of capacity in U.S. industries imply people are supposed to relocate to foreign countries to work? Cliff. No. I think uh, <clears throat> one thing, though, that uh, many people probably haven't focused on in terms of the domestic car companies is that um, prior to the credit crisis, which even the wildest critics of the car companies don't blame them for engineering, um, both General Motors and Ford had gone through massive restructuring, taken out almost half of their production capacity, had to buy out workers at about $140,000 a shot because of contracts with UAW workers to get their handle, hands around this uh, particular issue. Now, I might add they did it pretty smartly and they did it pretty quickly. Had they not done that, they'd be in more trouble uh, than they are now. However, uh, as a nation, if I can be a little patriotic, I, I find it bizarre to say we've got 3,000 or 3 million units worth of excess capacity. Let's take it out of the domestic side of it. Uh, we'd be the only country in the world that would play their cards that way. In a, in in Miami, after uh, NAFTA, um, there were a lot of garment businesses down there that just went completely out of business. But it, it was okay because they all went into construction. And NAFTA. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a couple of things. First of all, you know, other companies, are, uh, other countries were having trouble as well. So there's a question, you know, where you're going. First of all, but I also think that in the longer run, there's going to be a new set of opportunities here. Because you know, oil prices are not going to stay down where they are right now forever. And what you've seen over the last few years is a tendency for certain things that were outsourced. You know, like we might have timber that we would grow in Georgia, say, ship it over to China, have it uh, worked on, ship it back to the U.S. to do some stuff. As shipping costs and as it, as oil costs go up, you're going to see, I think, less of that. And I think you're going to see more. Uh, things kind of more uh, local, and uh, I think that'll somewhat offset uh, some of the stuff that's happening. But you'll you'll certainly see people move. You know, as, if, as Tom was saying, if you re reduce capacity in the automobile industry and other sectors, but it's not obvious to me it's going to be in other countries. Yeah, I, and I think it, there's another complexity here. It's easier to easy to paint this as Detroit versus uh, uh, foreign companies. The car manufacturing world is incredibly complex. Some of GM's best assets are, in fact, manufacturers in other countries like Holdren in, 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 in Australia. Um, and obviously, a lot of the foreign companies have now built U.S. plants that are going to stay in the U.S. And, be, and, and put people to work here. So even determining uh, what we mean by U.S. versus foreign can be oversimplified in some of this. But it is a question of look, we either continue to have a capacity of 16 million cars when we don't need it and find some way to subsidize that, which I think is a terrible idea, or we figure out some way of getting capacity out of the system. Um, and, and frankly, where it goes uh, probably is a secondary question, but I don't think it's necessarily going to go overseas at all. Well, as, just to add a figure to that, uh, something like 60 or 70 percent of the Toyotas that are sold in this country are assembled in this country. And, uh, and and people own shares in you know Toyota, uh, American investors. Exactly what it means to be a, a foreign company company is you know is is a debatable issue. And certainly a lot of people do work for Honda, Toyota, and the other you know Japanese companies right here in the United States. That, that's true, but they still import a huge number of units. And I would I would find it again odd that we would we'd have any conversation that said. We should be supporting cars that are built somewhere else over cars that are built here. And I'm not saying that in terms of paying a tariff or any of that. But, 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 but General Motors, uh, uh, 
when they make a car, often import parts right. from. There's no doubt. You know, there's no such gonna, thing no. as a U.S. built car. Yeah, that, so. that I agree with. But when you look at 16 million units and you say somebody needs to take out capacity, I'm not talking about domestic or import. Another question you have to ask is, does that capacity come out of the United States or does it come out of other countries? And right now, as we look around the world, everyone's getting a bit more protectionist, which is understandable. Everyone's going through the same problem. Uh, Toyota, which used to be called the uh, Bank of Japan, because at one point they had almost $40 billion of liquidity, now only has about $18 billion, which is pretty close to where Ford was until they just announced their fourth quarter um, earnings. But it, it, there are real issues, as you say, complexity here. And the 16 million units of capacity does not reside in the United States. And almost all of the excess capacity that did reside here was taken out in the last three years. Again, against the 16 million unit year, not 13. Let me another general question. It seems that all the problems we're currently dealing with can ultimately, ultimately be tied to greed. When will we, we ultimately learn how to deal with this? Never. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, when, when the physicists figure out how to repeal the law of gravity, the economists will be right behind them repealing the law of demand or abolishing greed. You know, well, I, you can talk to a three-year-old. Would you rather have two cookies or three? <laughs> I mean, you can, let's get beyond this kind of wordsmithing. Well, greed is, is an incredibly loaded term. I mean, it just <laughs> sounds bad, you know. But if you think about uh, self-interest uh, in terms of driving uh, innovation, driving new products, driving uh, service, to, uh, you know, it, it's a driving force in the economy. And certainly that self-interest has been very productive over time. Now, uh, one of the things I think that is true about self-interest. I don't think people have become any more self-interested <clears throat> now than they were in the caveman era. But as the environment becomes more complex, there are new ways and sometimes inappropriate ways to take advantage of self-interest that we're just discovering. You know, things like some of the stuff that was going on in some of the com companies like Enron and some of this accounting stuff, use of derivatives. You couldn't have done that 20 years ago because uh, these vehicles just weren't ava available. It's, I think it was Greenspan that you know, made, made, made the point originally. They said, look, people aren't getting greedier. It's just they have more avenues to, you know, to exercise greed. And as we learn more about how to deal in this complex environment, you know, uh, greed is good, I think. I mean, I wouldn't say greed is good, but self-interest is good. I was going to say it, green, green, it's another term for financial incentives, and, and our economy is based on having a set of financial incentives there. Uh, sometimes those d d d don't work perfectly, and and sometimes it's the fault of individual players in it, but this always is complex. Take, them, take them, the housing bubble and the mortgage. It wasn't just greedy lenders and greedy homeowners. Um, it was government policy to sort of get people into homes and push banks and lenders to drop things like 20% require, down payment requirements and to create, come up with creative financing so that you could fulfill a sort of bipartisan government notion that, that everybody should own a home. I'm not sure why everybody should necessarily own a home, but those kind of incentives that come into it from the government get responded to uh, appropriately by banks and others if things fall apart later and it's then labeled greed. And I think that's sometimes a very unfortunate. Yeah, but, I, but I think it crosses from financial incentive to greed when you have a community that's willing to sink a global economy. And when you look at banks bundling these things, bringing in the best and the brightest, they say, from MIT, to do the statistical analysis to put these packages together and then winking at each other that they're worth something, and banks ending up with leverage at 40 to 1, there isn't any banker that grew up through this banking career that said, yeah, let's have banks that are this heavily uh, leveraged. I think at that point you can say greed uh, started to play a role, not just financial incentive. Three of you participated in 2003 um, on a panel dealing with bankruptcy that the Journal of Applied Corporate Finance covered, and uh, they will be covering uh, the proceedings of this panel as well. What have we learned uh, about the efficient use of bankruptcy since that time? In what way has the process gotten better? In what way has it gotten worse? What are further rooms room for improvement? And well, Cliff, uh, Tom, Joel, and uh, Tom. Well, I think 
when we talked in 2003, one of the major focuses had been on whether Chapter 11 was too protective of, of current management and shareholders uh, by a process of delay. And, and Cliff made this general comment is that the, the sort of fundamental notion about a bankrupt company that is an insolvent company is that the, the old stakeholders, the shareholders and their representatives are now playing with other people's money because by the nature of, of limited liability, shareholders on a, aren't on the hook for anything, so their downside is zero, and they get all the upside. And so you start playing with somebody else's money, and you start making incredibly risky decisions uh, that aren't good for the institution as a whole. For a long time, Chapter 11 uh, uh, and was allowed, particularly by the bankruptcy uh, judges and others, to, to basically facilitate that kind of delay by the, the old shareholders and, and their managers. I think what you began to see in the 1990s was a, a speeding up of that process, um, a refusal to extend quite as often the exclusivity period in which only the, the, the shareholders and the representatives could speak. That was what we were talking about in 2003. I think that's continued, but it, it continues at a fairly glacial pace. Uh, yeah, I, I would say the changes haven't been that great since we had that panel in 2003. I, I still encounter in most of the Chapter 11s I'm involved in where management's trying to stay entrenched. I, I spoke a little bit about how they have to have their compensation approved. And they always try to get golden parachutes. and you, you have competing interests. What I am seeing is more active creditor constituencies and I think this year especially uh, for instance if you look at this the statistics of the filings are made in Delaware where many of the large bankruptcies are filed uh, every week there's nine and ten figure bankruptcy cases being filed there it's it's quite incredible because I'm on a circulation list uh, when cases get filed and I think you're gonna start seeing now this year much, much more aggressive, active participation by creditors. One of the problems is if you don't have a committee form, if you don't have a very large stakeholder, sometimes things go through the process that people may object to, but they don't have enough financial stake involved in the case to make an objection, make a case, go to court and hire professionals. That, that's going to be changing because there's significant financial interests at risk in all these large bankruptcies now. Is the bankruptcy of our country a possibility? If so, what are the consequences? Uh, no. <laughs> there, there's, there's no chapter for the country. Bond. Did somebody <laughs> say the printing press is important? Uh, yeah, what does what what bankruptcy of a country, a country mean? They, they have Chapter 9 for municipalities. I, I mean, look, the federal government, unlike the rest of us, get the opportunity to print money. <laughs> and they can tax. What, what, yeah, and if you don't pay the taxes, they can put you in jail. Or make uh, you something else. Or make you, or, you know. Or put, make you a cabinet member. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Who's in charge of the IRS? Yeah, so I... I you know, un unless someone is contemplating that we're going to run out of paper. <laughs> and what did they just do in Zimbabwe? They started printing $100,000 notes or something. I, I mean, just add zeros. This is not a problem. Yeah, but we could wind up, we could wind up with an awful lot of inflation. We could, we could wind up with some other dire consequences. But as a country going bankrupt, it's just not yeah. going to... The, the, pr the problem for the country because of the, the printing press is not a bankruptcy in the classic way that we think about bankruptcy. That doesn't mean we can't be messed up for years and, in fact, decades uh, with very serious problems, not all of which have necessarily played out so far. For example, a lot of our economy has had huge inflows of capital from other countries over time. If those countries decide that there are better investment opportunities someplace else in the world and start pulling that capital out of this country, um, the problems that we've had so far will be magnified in an extraordinary fashion. That's not bankruptcy, but it's not to say it's going to be pleasant. No. One thing that isn't well understood by a lot of people, I think, is, uh, is 
that is that debt, you know, is true that, you know, we do, if you look at it just on the debt side, that we'll say, oh, you know, everybody in America owes, you know, $25,000 or $30,000 or whatever it is. Look at all this debt. But it's also an asset to somebody. And about 75% of the debt that's government debt in this country is held by us. And so while we may owe, you know, 30000 apiece, there are also a bunch of people that have that as an asset. And so there are issues about wealth transfers and so on. But in terms of just looking at the debt side, you also got to look at the asset, asset side. Now, 25% or so of the debt that we have in this country is owned by, uh, you know, foreign entities, and that's a different issue. That does mean that we got to ultimately transfer uh, goods and services and products from this country elsewhere, ultimately, sometime. And so that will become an issue. But 75% of the debt is owned by ourselves. And that's less of an issue than if we owe it to somebody else. Jim, probably for you, um, the panel, uh, the participants mentioned how bankruptcy can deal with some of the adverse consequences of uh, franchising laws and dealer protection laws. Uh, wouldn't it be better to deal with the root causes as opposed to rely on bankruptcy? And what are the odds, what are the odds of seeing changes in state level franchising and dealer protection? What, you, when, you saw, when you say the root causes, what is that again? Sure. In terms of the state uh, franchising laws, state based uh, dealer protection legislation. Uh, I'm not sure I exactly understand the question. Uh, bankruptcy is a way to deal with uh, some oh, of the well, limits on companies. Well, there's two issues here that I see. One is I do think that uh, you know most states, almost all states, have these laws, and they uh, and I think that they're uh, make it difficult for automobile companies to be efficient and do business as well as they could if you know if they had a more relaxed environment. Now, I do think that uh, dealers have to worry about protecting investments and so on. And I think in terms of uh, a lot of that would be done through contracts, you know, obviously. And for example, I'm not going to invest in a dealership unless I have some contractual guarantee from a company. And I think it's important for the government to back these contracts. But the way it is right now, the fact that they can't own their own dealerships, that they can't deal over the internet, and so on, uh, directly from the manufacturer, I think that's problematic. And I think it increases the cost of automobiles. And I think legislation needs to take place. Now, the other issue, though, is what happens right now with you know, General Motors and dealing with 14,000 franchise contracts and so on. And I think there, it, it, that legislative action is not the uh, solution. And, and it'll take time to do that. I think there, you know, they have to renegotiate these contracts. They could try to renegotiate them and deal with it outside of bankruptcy. But, but when people are fighting over pieces of the pie, as opposed to worrying about how pie, big the pie is, I think it's, it's going to be difficult. So I'd like to, you know, I think there are two issues here. I think the government should, federal government should think about the legislative acts, but I do think that these kind of immediate problems are not handled legislatively, they're handled through bankruptcy. I, I'd answer the question by saying generally yes, it would be great if you could deal with these um, by, by eliminating some of them across the board so that people don't have to file for bankruptcy to deal with franchise agreements. That is. The, the history of the last 20 years of, of, of General Motors might look very different if it didn't have to deal with the franchise uh, laws that it had. Um, on the other hand, politically doing that, uh, Jim mentioned it, it, it's blocked at the state level. Whether it would block at the federal level is, 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 is questionable. And bankruptcy without even thinking about the issue, that is because of the idea of the rejection of executory contracts in bankruptcy, has a ready-made solution for it. Um, but, it, but in general, I prefer solutions that are across the board than bankruptcy specific, and so I think the general idea would well, be, yes, it would be better if you could, but I don't think you can. Let, let me just say, uh, a, a fairly well-established principle that comes out of political science is this is the kind of problem that's intractable. You're extraordinarily unlikely to get a political resolution of this problem simply because the people that are in favor that benefit from these franchise laws are a small number of well-organized people with massive concentrated benefits, namely the dealerships. And the people that these laws disadvantage, the costs are imposed on lots of people, namely everybody that ever bought a car. And the, the costs individually or small, collectively they're large. 
So it's just very expensive. There's this collective action problem. It's hard to get millions of people excited about being mugged for 50, 100, 500 bucks each when that winds up transferring suitcases full of money to the, and, and the, the people that get big benefits make big political contributions. And that keeps politicians at bay from coming in and saying, oh yeah, I promise to maximize social welfare. That's what my eighth grade civics teacher said as a politician I was supposed to do. Let me go make the world a better place. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> I, yeah, I, mean, yeah, hey, I got to jump in here a second. I'm talking about dealers. Uh, yeah, so it would, politically, we don't have the will to do a lot of things we should do. I mean, there should be a federal franchise law. If a dealer goes out of business or if they want to stop doing business, a company wants to stop doing business with, uh, with a dealer, there should be a contract that says this is what we're going to pay you. You use the example of um, Oslobiel, which was somewhere, no one will tell the real number, but it was somewhere between one and two billion. I keep hearing 1.2 billion, but it's, it's got Rick Wagner so afraid he won't even touch the subject anymore. There are, there are 400, and I think it's 440 Saturn dealers who are very, by the way, excellent dealers, but are not making any money. They should be put to rest. They also own a lot of other franchises, so it's not like you're putting them out of business. If it was merely a matter of General Motors going out and saying, we'll buy back the tools, the parts, the sign, we'll pay you all the money that we owe you, et cetera, which is what the actual contract says, you wouldn't be talking about $1.2 billion to $2 billion. No. They want blue sky. Now, there is no blue sky in a Saturn franchise which hasn't made any money in the last dozen years. But that's what the dealers want. And that's where the intractable problem comes sure. from. So if you did have a fed federal law, which I realize would be akin to a lot of other things we talked about tonight that aren't going to happen, um, you could solve that problem. I don't think bankruptcy, by the way, though, is the issue um, from a dealer standpoint for a lot of reasons. But boy, when you've called on dealers and fought with them, it sure sounds sweet to be able to do that. Uh, but there are other issues that, that would come to play. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to add. You, you're right that there are some hidden costs in the, in the system and there are some inefficiencies. But manufacturers tried to run um, car dealerships. The uh, dealers immediately, by the way, passed legislation so they couldn't do it anymore. But I think the people who behind the scenes were trying to get the states to pass the law were the manufacturers themselves after they started losing as much money as they did. I mean, they tried it and saw it. They needed the a law to protect them from themselves? Uh, basically. <laughs> You know, there's there's nothing there's there's nothing. This is one of those three stooges kind of moments. There, there's, right? there's no there's no there's nothing more fun than believing you know how to do something that somebody else is doing very well and you don't. Well, if you look at unregulated or less regulated distributor uh, distributor relations in other industries, you almost never see a corner solution where you have 100 percent dealerships or 100 percent company-owned right. stores. It, it kind of varies depending upon uh, the environment and which one makes the most sense. Maybe you see 80% dealerships, you know, or 80% franchises, 20% uh, vertically integrated or owned by the central company, but the federal government or the state governments don't allow automobile companies to make these choices. And in fact, they don't make, let them even write their own contracts in a sense because they've got provisions that kind of override what out of voluntary contracting you might have. But that isn't the real obstacle. People do buy cars over the internet every day. I mean, the, the truth is we built a, um, a They do what? They buy cars over the internet every day. From the manufacturer? From, uh, not from the manufacturer. But, but the, that's but the point. We, but that you're assuming that it's it's more efficient to buy it from the manufacturer than it would be from the dealer. I, I'm is, assuming is, that allowing people to experiment with that model is something that is got a regulatory stop sign at the intersection it says you can't turn down that street and we'll never know well, well, let me give you an example but, 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 let me finish the one thing we know is that when you buy a car that's not the last time you have to go into a dealership i'm sorry to say that even toyotas have to go back i not heard that so there's a whole array of things that go on in a car transaction that go beyond just buying a car just buying the car but let's assume that's all you had to do you still would end up having to set up a company that could deliver cars somewhere. That costs money. I tried to create a, car, a company called CarBuzz, 
which actually tried to do that. We looked at all the figures. It's not inexpensive. You have an infrastructure there right now that not only can deliver the cars, is basically, in most instances, willing to give the cars away for almost nothing, will be there to service them, can help you with your trade, and can sort out your finances in a way a manufacturer cannot. Doesn't mean the experience is all fun. It's probably not uh, in some cases. But it does work. Well, let me give you an example of where uh, of, of something Ford tried, and then they got blocked by, by regulation. Uh, in Texas, there was a time around the year 2000, I think, where uh, Ford had a bunch of, uh, they have pre-owned automobiles or used cars that they get, and they wanted to be able to market them uh, over the internet. And so the idea was that they'd enter, you, you're right, you have to have somebody deliver them. And so they entered into partnerships with various dealerships in the Houston area, I believe it was, or some places they wanted to deal with in Texas, who would, uh, you would see it on the Ford internet site, the customer would say, oh, I want to go test drive that. Ford could deliver it to a dealership, they could test drive it, and it was, a, you know, might have worked, might not have, but they didn't really get a chance to do it. It wasn't the consumer, certainly, that were yelling at this. It was other dealers who were saying, nope, nope, that's a violation of, you know, Texas law, and then all of a sudden, they're in the court saying, oh, yeah, you can't do that. Now, again, whether you want to do that or exactly what you want to do, I don't know, but I agree with Cliff that by tying your hands behind your back and saying you can't, that's... Find out. Look, we'll never find out. When, when there was a, a reference to uh, the Japanese experience when they had some missteps in the 90s. And, and, and one of the things that I, I like to think back on are the discussions that really peaked in the 80s about the, the Japanese industrial policy and Japan Inc. and how these guys were going to compete the U.S. right off the map. And, and, and Business Week and Fortune would write articles in glowing terms about Meaty uh, and, 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 you know, sort of an Al Gore kind of solution to industrial policy for the, the country. And, They'd point out the emphasis in quality and how Japan had gone from a, a, a devastated country, country at the end of the Second World War to a real global power. And, and the, the, the sense, you know, this is like the finance professor's discussion of diversification turned on its head. You had a small number of admittedly really smart people making huge coordinated bets within the Japanese manufacturing industry. And when those bets turned out well, Japan productivity soared. We've never used that model in the U.S. It's been a large, large, large number of people putting their own intuition, business model, business strategy on the line. And what winds up happening here is there's a tremendous amount of robustness in the U.S. economy because there are literally millions and millions of these bets being made. Some of them turn out wonderfully, you know, Google. Some of them crash and burn in ways that you never heard of, you never will hear. The, 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 the problem with these kinds of laws is they absolutely say certain kinds of experimentation is out of bounds. We are legally going to prohibit you from trying that business model. And I just want to tell you that stopping that kind of experimentation is not free. I'm not, I'm not sitting here trying to argue that, well, if Ford had been allowed to do this, this would have been a multi-billion dollar product line for them. It might have blown right up in their face. My point is more narrow. We will never know. And I'd rather have the American business community making calculated bets 
putting their money where their mouth is than having somebody in Washington or Albany say, no, as a regulatory matter, we're not going to let you see if that would work or not. You wind up with a very large portfolio of options when you allow that kind of experimentation. And a portfolio of options is dramatically more valuable than an option on a portfolio. One, uh, last comment. The finance professor on the panel. <laughs> I mean, in terms of potential uh, payoff for changes in distribution systems, again, this, I'm not saying this would necessarily work, but some people have suggested, you think about uh, the way we buy computers. Right. If you want to buy a computer from Dell or you want to buy an Apple computer, usually you might go on to an internet, you might sign up and say, oh, I want this feature, I want this feature, and then they manufacture to order. One of the problems that the car companies have each year is they've got to figure out what are people going to buy, what colors do they want, what models, they got to, and they produce this stuff, they ship it out, maybe people buy it, maybe they don't, and then you have a lot of cars left over. Now, people will say, well, people don't want, you know, they want to touch the car, they want to drive it. Maybe you have some centers where people could go and drive some cars test it and say, yeah, okay, now I can wait two weeks if it means I get it for $3,000 less or $5,000 less. So, you know, there may be some really innovative models out there that if we were allowed to try or the, you know, the companies were allowed to try, you know, could really be productive. I think there's been more experimentation than you can realize. But one of the shocking things that I found out Let's say they'd like to get the convertible. Don't you think they dream of that car in some color? With a certain interior, with the right type of piping, and the right color room? Why are you going to spend that money? 90% of all Rolls Royces are bought off the showroom floor of the Rolls Royces. So when we say, sure, they'll buy it over the internet and they'll wait two weeks, some people will. The majority, with the bomb of type, whatever. LA will do 16,000 units a year because they can deliver them in an hour and a half. That's the thing. Well, we've come to the witching hour. Uh, let me close uh, with a couple comments. Uh, Japan came up uh, a few times in the remarks. Uh, just had the opportunity two weeks ago to go back to Japan uh, for the first time in about 15 years. And when you asked our alums there uh, and uh, business uh, types, uh, the economic situation. What was uh, one of the striking takeaways is how much in the ethos of that country right now is this uh, feeling of a lost decade and worry that uh, the latest downturn uh, may trigger a similarly prolonged episode because of the, the difficulty of restructuring uh, due to cultural norms, due to some uh, different legal structures there uh, that uh, didn't permit uh, as rapid a a change in, in, uh, in light of circumstances that changed in the macro economy. Uh, had a, on a similar vein, had an opportunity a few years ago to meet with Craig Barrett, uh, Cliff just mentioned with me, where at Intel uh, they went through a period when Fortunate Business Week was writing up uh, Japan Inc. And they would go, Barrett would say as the CEO, uh, on an annual pilgrimage to Japan to try to learn better uh, how to do business in Japan. And what they finally started noticing was uh, the business cards of their firm had email addresses and how slow the Japanese system was to adopt email addresses. And that, at least with Intel, led to a fairly dramatic ability for executives to start brainstorming how can we take this firm to the next level. So one observation in terms of uh, dealing with changes. A second one, uh, when you look at stock market performance over the last year, while it's been uh, pretty bad, in the United States, uh, we're still about 8% ahead of the world economy. And then third, uh, we have about 50% uh, of our incoming full-time students that come from other countries. Uh, a number are here tonight, as well as uh, some domestic students. And what's still striking is that even with the downturn, uh, about 80% will want to look for opportunities in the US. Uh, so in terms of being able to uh, come up with ideas and run with uh, put real money or their careers on the line. Uh, with that in mind, want to 
put in a pitch uh, for those of you that are looking to hire some bright talent. We have uh, two opportunities in addition to just contacting us directly. Uh, we have a session on Wednesday, February 25th from 4.30 to 6.30. Our surveys tell us 70% of the students that come to Simon would, from uh, another location would end up staying here. They fall in love with the area and we're hoping to promote more mixing and matching so if we can bring some talent to your attention. We encourage you to join us for that evening. We can get you more details. Uh, there's some outside. And the second one will happen April 17th. We're working with several other upstate universities uh, to develop a, a, a coordinated approach to bringing talent to the four uh, for, uh, firms in our area. I want to thank our panelists uh, for their insights and for their participation in tonight's uh, event. I want to thank the audience for joining us. So feel free to come up and ask the panelists some questions that didn't get asked. And, uh, we wish you all the best as this uh, new year uh, proceeds.